first I want to say welcome to all of you. It's absolutely wonderful to have you here. And I want you to know that uh, all of us working through this process at the University of Texas at Austin, as well as the, all of the organizers, which include several people, Jackie Angel, Cocos, Marquides, Mark Hayward, and, and myself, we are so delighted to be able to work through this process as a continuation of the wonderful series that's gone on at the University of Texas at Austin for the last several years. And now, of course, now we have the opportunity to regain uh, that same momentum over the next three years. This is the first of a series, and the next one will be at the University of Texas at Austin. The real issue uh, that we will all face, regardless of our interests in terms of ethnicity or gender or politics or partisanship, et cetera, is uh, what's being referred to as the fiscal cliff, the fiscal cliff. It really is about budgets and tax policy, both for the nation as a whole, for an aging society, and for the emerging Latino population. That's really what this election is all about. When you get beyond all the silliness and the rhetoric and all those uh, commercials, it really is about uh, where this country will be in 2013 and beyond. And to what extent the American public will be willing to once again renew a social contract that in its simplest form had the public willing to raise taxes for whatever good things, willing to invest in others, willing to sacrifice in the short term so that there will be communal benefits in the long term whether it was the greatest generation after the Great Depression, whether it was investments in our highways and our public infrastructure and the GI Bill after World War II, whether it was the expansion of public benefits in the 1960s and beyond. I mean, we really have reached a crossroads as to where the American public will lean or fall or decide in terms of whether or not they want the kind of social contract we've enjoyed the last 30 to 60 years, or they want to go to some other version which some cynics would say would bring us back to the 1920s and before, but that's uh, what the cynics might say. So the reason why I wanted to take this survey is because when we began this conference series back in 2001, it, we had a very small, intimate group. Doug Wolf and Beth Soldo were our keynote speakers, and most of our participants were from Texas. We have now five installments later. You can see how diverse we are. Think about physiological change in the very long run, and Mexico's a good case to try to study because of the fact that a lot of change has taken place very rapidly in Mexico. So this is my basic hypothesis, that with uh, the epidemiological revolution and the technological revolution that we basically all have experienced, there have been major physiological changes and that the end of these revolutions is that we end up with different bodies from the ones that we started with before these revolutions. And we need to think about that when we think about how we deal with some of the issues. Um, and so overall, uh, the federal poverty level, everybody from academics through legislators agrees outdated. It really isn't an accurate measure of the need that older adults face um, in their daily lives. And as a result, it's inadequate for research, for policy, for understanding um, the situation of older adults in the 21st century. One alternative um, is the Elder Index. It more accurately gauges the income needed for economic security by seniors. And with the situation of older Latinos being more likely to be in rental housing, more likely to be in urban areas where housing costs are higher, um, being in more complicated family circumstances, the federal poverty line provides a very poor measure. I want to, to talk about uh, very briefly this uh, two uh, new uh, sources of uh, new data sources. For the first time in the National Health and Nutrition Survey, we have a specific, uh, we developed in the National Institute of Geriatrics a specific model dealing with the health of the, of the elderly. Uh, there are um, about 5,000 uh, elderly individuals in, in this uh, data set. And, and as the first report was uh, presented last uh, Friday, this uh, data will soon be available for 
for open uh, use and, and we, you can contact us if you are interested on, on working with this, uh, with this information. And I'd say that these studies represent an evidence-based support that hopefully can convince or help advocate with government and policymakers to importance of implementing these interventions and not only save lives but save money for, for the government. Uh, it's also an important tool potentially to evaluate uh, impact of public policies. One can say, we're going to do this, I don't care what the data says, and then, but you can actually model it by collecting data you already collect routinely to see what, what might happen and what you end up seeing in, in five years. Um, and then I would also say that the development of these type of studies really could be invaluable for all of Latin America's uh, program against uh, non-communicable uh, non diseases, particularly uh, in, the, in the countries with um, uh, most, uh, uh, most along the lines of this epidemiological transition. So, I want to prepare you, because if you think about the presentations you've heard over the last you know, day or so, you know, I think people have talked about flying at 10,000 or 20 or 30,000 feet. Well, you've got to parachute down now into sort of the clinic setting and um, to a smaller scale study, but one that I think um, you know, illustrates uh, the value of combining qualitative and quantitative methods um, and uh, you know, I think has some, some interesting results. We've done a little bit of additional work, my colleagues and I at the University of Texas, <clears throat> and we're showing that nativity is playing a critical role in what we see for um, the mortality rates of Hispanics in the United States. And in particular, there is a divide, <clears throat> a substantial divide by a number of years that separate um, native-born Hispanics from foreign-born Hispanics. And from our perspective, the Hispanic paradox is partly a story about nativity. And we will continue to talk about the role of nativity more broadly through the other domains of health. Over time, since um, birth registration became universal in the US after the 1930s, that has, has decreased. But basically, people that weren't registered at birth, uh, when they report their age later in life, um, they kind of, if they're 97, they'll say they're 100. It's more you know, interesting to be 100 than 97. 97 is not that cool. So. Um, that's, that's the issue that, um, that we have to deal with. And then the other explanations, we all know cultural, behavioral effects. Behavior, we've talked a lot, uh, or you've, we've heard a lot about smoking, and um, that's a big issue, and, and I, I've done a little digging into that area, and it confirms what Mark was saying, um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. And then the issue of migration effects and return migration. To respond to what we say here, what are the methodological challenges that we have agreed on or we have not agreed on and sh what should we do better? I know we're, we've done better in life tables, thanks to Elizabeth. Uh, we've come a long way in really making corrections and giving us better estimates of uh, mortality. So I would like to propose that you know the mortality estimates that we have today are much better than they were before and they are um, supporting the so-called <laughs> Hispanic paradox, uh, which may not be just a Hispanic paradox. Somebody said it's really maybe a, an immigrant paradox, because all immigrants to the United States, uh, and, and also to the UK, less to the UK, but uh, Australia and Canada, uh, immigrants from non-Western uh, backgrounds tend to be selected and, and, and healthier. Uh, and then by the time they get older, they, they get worse. <laughs> the paradox is becoming the new conventional wisdom. It needs to be challenged. So we really appreciate these mortality estimates, life expectancy estimates, especially the subgroups. We look forward to those ep estimates. But the question remains, the question remains whether or not we have an agreement, a consensus, on how this paradox is, is sort of playing out in terms of the impact it's having on uh, people's lives, the extent to which this extended life expectancy is uh, creating potential burden on families and the state. So I think uh, there's sort of two issues here, which is reaching consensus on, uh, based on all its competing explanations, 
do we agree that one explains better this advantage, this mortality uh, advantage, and number two, what are, again, the implications of this paradox? And I don't think that we've reached consensus on that. Um, so I, I just wanted to not only support what you said about selection, but just warn not to put all your eggs in the basket of selection, to look at, at uh, other social factors and cultural factors, uh, and not simply selection, um, and to also look within at, at things like uh, Asian migration and, and so on, and not, not make those simple divides between native-born and foreign-born. You know, mortality is the easiest to defend, assuming the data are, are, are clean and they're getting better. And, uh, and it's the, the strongest evidence we have. Something happens to immigrants after they come here between their 20s and their 70s, right? Where they may uh, get old with uh, maybe even lower prevalence of many diseases except diabetes in, in the Mexican origin population. But they, they do have more disability. And uh, some of that may be the environmental challenges that Mark uh, Hayward spoke about where immigrants um, live in certain lifestyles and in certain environments where you know they, they are more likely to, mm -hmm. to say they're disabled because they, they are. As uh, an aging researcher who really focuses on longitudinal data, I've learned an awful lot by being here in this largely epidemiological sort of approach to, um, uh, of these very you know, monstrous data sets that I would only love to, to get a chance to take a look at these sort of things. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we have used our time, but you've been so fruitful as you have been throughout the entire conference. Your recommendations are certainly going to be recorded and distilled into a, a final analysis for us to use going forward for planning. And so I know for all of you who came from far and wide, it was a sacrifice of your time, and I certainly wish uh, you well on your return home and also say to you, I hope your time was well spent. Thank you so much. Thank you.